Good morning. Hands and feet and faces and people come on, you know, <laughs> their palm adjusting something or an errant limb, you know, going across the screen. Or if you talk to me on a regular basis, you'll see a cat tail going across the screen. It's kind of fun. Well, good morning, happy or afternoon or middle of the night or, you know, where you, wherever you are happy sunday if it's even sunday for you i don't know it might be tuesday where you are it might not be to sunday yet maybe you're still in friday i don't know happy whatever day it is happy today to you it's nice to be here feels like i was just here and um <laughs> i was just here with some of you <laughs> Corey and amaryllis and laura and who else? We did a little one day retreat yesterday. Um, who else was with us? Look at my other screen. Harvey was there. Yeah. Yeah, that was nice. It was wonderful. And so we did a thing yesterday on um, journeys. What's it? What does it mean to be on a journey and what's it like? And I think we'll probably sort of continue in that vein today. I can't seem to get out of it. So I'm in my I'm coming to you live from my my uh, in laws spare bedroom as I'm on my own journey. So wherever you are, we'll be we'll be here on the journey together. So let's sit for a minute just to get settled in. We'll see where that takes us next. sound of the bell like a beacon calling us in gifts from the far ocean the early Polynesians and Hawaiians their creation myths are full of the world coming out of the ocean the world emerges and takes form out of the vast open sea not so different from Zen and you can feel how even in the the stillness of meditation there's this kind of I don't know there's some subtle movement happening the world is churning on we are churning on Or maybe you're gliding, sliding, stumbling, whatever. However your meditation's going. Okay, then it's funny my mind like look down and see how many people are here as though that <laughs> will give me some indication of how I should behave or what I should say or something so that's a thing so good morning again I think I probably said that but interesting the this concept of what it is to be on a journey and and um and what the reality is of it as well and that's one of the things i noticed the most is so just to say uh, maybe some of you already know i'm moving to hawaii which is where i'm from originally but we've been in washington state for several months and before that we were in texas and so um lots of moving and so this this fascination with journeys and particularly the early polynesian wayfinders grew out of that like desire to kind of discover what is like what am i doing What's it like that I'm doing right now in my own life? It's one of the things that 
is really apparent is that throughout this whole process, my mind is looking for waypoints, looking for something to navigate by, some sort of stick in the sand or petroglyph or lighthouse or buoy or something like that. It's always kind of searching. And so that looking to see how many people are here would be a great, just a tiny example of how to, how do we orient ourselves? What do we orient ourselves by? And um, we've all got our favorite things, you know, um, other people's opinions of us or the world or our own opinions of us or the world, both equally irrelevant. Um, the weather, our emotional state, psychological state, physical state, you know, um, getting ready for this talk this morning. It's like I had to do this whole checklist of, have I used the bathroom? Yes. Okay. Do I have a glass of water? Yes. Okay. Have I eaten enough? Yes. Okay. Did I meditate this morning? No. Ah, oh, shit. Well, okay. Well, we'll meditate when we get there. Have we used the bathroom? Yes, we already did, but we need to again. So this like whole kind of preparation list of embarking on this little hour and a half journey with all of you. And it's kind of a sweet thing that there's that part of my mind is always like keeping an eye on the agenda. Did we do all the things and are we prepared? And so there's a, and that quality of the mind is great for, I don't know, somehow it gets me where I'm going. I mean, it got me here. And at the moment, I don't have to use the bathroom and I've got a cup full of water and I'm not hungry. And so that's good. But um, you can tell how that mind, when it gets kind of overblown and we start putting more and more of our eggs in that basket, it starts to separate us from like, at some point it gets in the way of really just being here. You know, and being exposed, exposing ourselves to the influence of our lives, really the journey of our lives, whatever that is. And um, the great thing about a journey, maybe I'll say something about it, what I mean by a journey. One thing that we discovered yesterday in the retreat, which was really wonderful, is um, that people are like on multiple journeys all the time. You know, people are the journey of aging and retirement and illness and raising children and, you know, going to the grocery store and trying to heal my Achilles tendonitis and et cetera, et cetera, all these things, getting over a cold, whatever it is, we're all like, we're going through this passage all the time. And so that's kind of a cool thing that you can rely on actually is that like, you don't have to worry about leaving home because you've already left home. You're already on the path and you can't go back and uh, another fun thing that we discovered is it's really hard to tell when the journey began and when it will end like at what point do you say i began the journey um i don't know when i began the journey to move back to hawaii was it when we put an offer on the house or was it three years ago when we visited my parents there or was it a year before that when i started having dreams about hawaii or was it before you know etc it goes back and back and back so this is wonderful sense of i don't know kind of always being at sea on the voyage in some way and um people have been asking me like i talked to I, my my job is to talk to people and um uh, so I'm trying to keep people updated about when are we moving and will that disrupt our conversations and all this other stuff. And, and um, we're supposed to be gone uh, on Wednesday, a few days from now, but things aren't happening right with the house and the, there's a quarantine thing, trying to get the cat to Hawaii without him having to sit in quarantine. We've got to do all these things and all those things are kind of going terribly wrong. And so people will ask me, so when are you moving? And I say, I don't know. I really don't know. Well, oh, before that, it was, are you excited? And I'd kind of check and I go, well, no. And then I start to go, well, am I supposed to be excited? Should I, is there something wrong with me that I'm not excited? Am I missing something that I'm not excited? But that's just, that's not the stage of the journey that I was at yet. Clearly things were like changing inside of me, but I wasn't at the stage yet where excitement was like the thing. And now people are asking me, are you worried? No. <laughs> I'm not worried yet either. So it's kind of a cool. And then I go, oh, am I supposed to be worried? Well, let me think. And then I'd start thinking about logistics. And well, did we miss something? And do we check all the boxes? And a friend of a friend of my family's who, who I've known for decades emailed me 
and we were talking back and forth about the house not closing. It's this thing about the previous owner has all these unpaid HOA fees and the bank's trying to get in touch with the HOA to get them paid off and blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know, I don't really know where we're at with that. And he says, well, what do you need to do? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know. He said, well, you should ask your real estate agent. <laughs> I just thought, I don't know. I can kind of trust that there's not much I can do. I could harass my real estate agent. I could try to call the HOA myself. I could call the bank. I'd, I could do all these things. But at the moment, it just feels like it's not really in my hands. But it's interesting how difficult it is to trust that sometimes. Well, that actually we're being cared for and things are being taken care of. And surely there is a time for action. And, um, but also there's a time for not getting wrapped up in thinking about that I should be doing something that I'm not doing. Da, 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 like notice how that happens. Somebody raised a really great question in the retreat yesterday, which was, so how do you, we're talking about things on a journey, things start to fall away. You know, you notice that on a big journey, small journey, it could be sim as simple as I went to the grocery store for three things and I forgot one of them. So <laughs> bananas fell away. But oftentimes when things fall away, it feels like they're falling apart or they're breaking or if, and it can feel like madness or great danger or conflict or like this great sort of force rising up in the experience. And her question was, well, how do you know when it's just things falling away or things are falling apart and like something is required of you in the situation? And that's a great question. I don't have an answer for it, but I like the question. So I think asking a question like that sort of hones, hones my sense of being here in the Tao and what my relationship to it is at any given time. You know? So I've certainly had situations where I tried to overmanage things. I was selling a car once. I've probably told the story before, but I was selling my car and I was really anxious about it. And I was like running around, like trying to jam in this new stereo that didn't really fit at the last minute. And I was like, vacuuming it and doing a like armor alling it. And, and um, I was so nervous about pleasing everyone else and getting my car sold that I like underpriced it and I scheduled people to look at it kind of stacked on top of each other. And I was running around like crazy and I was just miserable. And so I showed it to this first couple and they seemed really nice. And I was like trying to be a salesman, which I'm really not. And uh, it all felt very like, like if you could think of a time like that right now, go and think of a time when you've like tried really hard to manage some kind of process or something unfolding or your relationship with somebody or your meditation. I'm sure nobody here has ever tried to manage their meditation and feel that for a second. What's it like to be there? What's it feel like in your body to be like struggling for control of something like that? This is the, and the image that comes to my mind about what's going on in my mind at that moment is like crisscrossing freeway overpasses all going in and out of each other. And I'm trying to drive on all of them all at once. So you get that. You get that sense. And my behavior was kind of like an expression of that. It's just all over the place. So the best thing that happened was I showed the car to the first people. And I was rushing off to show it to the second people. And I took a, le a blind left turn and I got T-boned by another car. And um, I remember looking out the window and seeing the car coming and going, no, 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 no. <laughs> they hit me. Fortunately, they, they were probably only going 20 or 30 miles an hour. And we pulled over to this gas station and the lady got on. She goes, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? And, and I was just like, I kind of checked and I felt this incredible relief. I looked at my car and it was all smashed. It's like, there's no way I'm going to be able to sell this car. <laughs> Actually, my first thought was, oh my God, my wife is going to kill me. And then the second thought was this incredible relief that had been taken out of my hands. I'm like the universe removed the burden from me in a way. And, um, and I started apologizing to her because I'd been making a blind left turn. And, 
and uh, she was very sweet about it. She was unharmed and I was unharmed and sort of the car was able to kind of limp most of the way home. And, uh, and I just remember that the knot, the knot loosening, seeing that the car was beyond repair. Um, and then uh, got the insurance company to take a look at it. And they gave me like a thousand more dollars than I was asking for it anyway. So that's kind of the cherry on top. So it doesn't always happen that cleanly. That's kind of an easy way to go. Oh yeah, I see the blessing of, you know, of giving up a bit, letting things take over, being smashed or taken over. It was, uh, we just moved out of our little tiny one bedroom house where we've been, we've been renting for the last nine months. God, we've been here for nine months. We were only supposed to be here for three months, but three months turned into six months, turned into nine months. We've got a toddler and we've got a cat and it's a really small place. And we've tried really hard not to mess it up. Uh, the, and the owners are really nice. And so we wanted to do right by them. And, and uh, if you've ever had a toddler and or a cat, you know how difficult it is sometimes to keep them from messing things up. But we managed to do it. Only minor scratches on the floor and where my toddler had peeled up some of the wallpaper, I was able to like paste it back down. It's all looking good. We're like doing the last wipe down of the house. I'm standing on top of the toilet trying to wipe the top of the bathroom wall. And um, if I can, well, I won't show you the thing. But uh, there's this old school like blue, pastel blue molded sink from like the 60s, it looks like. And then these two lamps that stick up. And I just bumped this one lamp. And there it went. And it was one of those moments where you see it in slow motion. No, and it went down and it hit the sink. And I remember thinking, oh, man, oh, I didn't hit break as it hit the sink, but then it leaped out of the sink and it went down to the ground and it smashed. Which, um, come to think of it, I don't remember talking to the landlords as they did the walkthrough yesterday about that, but I don't know. There's some kind of like, that seemed right somehow. It was kind of a, um, the thing I likened it to is like christening a vessel with a bottle, breaking a bottle of champagne on the bow of a vessel for good luck before it goes off on the voyage. There's something about, I don't know, it was a little too perfect that we got out of there without breaking anything. And also, when you look at the bulb, you can see it had been cracked multiple times and somebody had kind of like messily slapped on some kind of epoxy or something to keep this thing going. I'm like, I don't know, it was time for it to go. It just needed me to come along. I mean, I barely touched it. The thing fell off. That's what I told my wife anyway. But so, and I didn't have a big thing about it. It wasn't, oh my God, I never saw a little part of my mind says something like that. But I don't know, it felt kind of, it felt kind of free. So we can even trust those things that happen when things break, when things fall apart, when things fall away. That that's actually like, that's one of the hallmarks that something new is arising. That the old thing breaks, the old thing falls apart. So we can manage to not get too excited about that. <laughs> It's kind of nice, but also you might get excited about it and whatever. And that's part of it too. The, the, the part of the journey is traversing through that mind that makes a problem out of things. That's a big, like, what's that? The, the uh, two people were sailing on a ship and oh, crap. Let me look this up. I want to get it right. Please hold. In case you didn't already know this, if you're ever looking for a koan, you can Google whatever you know about the koan and then put Pacific Zen after it and like Corey Hitchcock and probably Karen and all kinds of our master um, webmaster wizards. There's like every koan known to man <laughs> somewhere in the, I don't know if it's just in Kalpa or if it's available to everybody, but. Anyway, but here's the con. In Japan, long ago, a great minister, a high government official named UD, sounds like a Chinese name, but he asked a master who is called Shiyu Daotong about a line in the scripture. 
He said, what is meant by, because of unfortunate circumstances, fierce winds blew the ship off course and set it drifting toward the land of the flesh-eating demons? What is meant by that? Because of unfortunate circumstances, fierce winds blew the ship off course and set it drifting toward the land of the flesh-eating demons. Call it the traditional name for them is Rakshasas. And the master replied, Minister, why are you so ignorant? Why are you asking about that? The minister's face turned white, all the blood drained away. That's that moment when the, you realize that the car is going to slam into your car or that the lamp is falling and it's going to break. <gasps> and the master said, because of unfortunate circumstances, fierce winds blew them off course and set them adrift toward the land of the flesh-eating demons. And the minister understood. So that's the thing. Why are you so ignorant? Why are you asking about that? <gasps> that, that is the land of the flesh-eating demons. So kind of nice to know that we can survive that, too. In a way, we're always not too far from the land of the flesh-eating demons on whatever journey we're on. And, um, and actually, in our tradition, getting to know the demons and perhaps even befriending them is an important part of the awakening process. You kind of can't get away with it without that. You can't like, <laughs> there's no way to skip over the land of the flesh-eating demons or to like sail way out of the way of the flesh-eating demons. You know, I'll just take the southern route. Um, it reminds me of uh, a place in the Odyssey where Odysseus and his crew are sailing the Strait of Messina and they've got monsters on both sides of them. And it doesn't matter what kind of navigator you have, you can't pass, you have to pick one or the other. You're going to lose crew members by both. And the more you try to mess around with it and try to escape, the more, what do they say? I can't remember the exact line, but for one of them, it's either Charybdis or Scylla. It's these great like, tentacles or arms that will grab men. Don't stop the ship and try to fight with her. You'll only lose more men. So there's this kind of thing about people will die on the journey parts of you will fall away on the journey. And, um, and it's just part of it. And in a way, they, they won't have fallen off in vain. We won't have lost things in vain um, if we include them. I think that's the thing. If we include them, like light a stick of incense for the lamp that I broke yesterday. <laughs> Light a stick of incense for the car that got smashed, or you know, it doesn't have to be wrong. Um, I have a friend who recently got a cancer diagnosis, and he's uh, he's pretty terrified at first, and and then something kind of broke in him, and um, it was really interesting. And and previous to that, he he'd been in some life circumstances that he was really pretty unhappy about. He's living in a place he didn't really want to live, and felt really disconnected and uh, from the world around him, and didn't feel like he had a community. And then he got cancer. And um, fortunately, it's fairly minor as cancers go. Operation was good. We got on immunotherapy and stuff. But it's, you know, it's kind of a cliche story, but it's cliche for a reason. And then things started shifting internally for him. Started like his, his, um, it became more and more clear to him what's really important. And so he quit the part-time job that he really didn't need to work and was kind of aggravating anyway. And he's starting to think about moving back to where he's from because that like it's a place that he loves. And he's starting to think about this and he's starting to think about that. And somehow all the things that have been kind of out of focus and out of reach for him over the last several months are starting to coalesce in a way that I think neither of us had really expected. I thought, oh my God, this guy's going to be kind of stuck forever. But somehow the diagnosis and the treatment and, and part of that is the fact that for about the first week after his monthly immunotherapy treatment, he's exhausted all the time. He can make, you know, he can get up and he can make his meals. Maybe he can do some reading, but he's just really tired, which is this thing you go, oh, how terrible. But I don't know. It's really forcing him to focus on, well, I've only got so much energy and so much time. What do I want to do it with? I've been babbling to him for months about 
present moment and meditation. Isn't it great to be mindful? And he goes, ah, but now he's great. He's like, sounds like a Zen master. He's talking about, I'm just always here. And I can't worry too much about what I'm going to do tomorrow because I don't know what tomorrow is going to be like. I just think about what do I want to do right now? What's in front of me? So there's that kind of way that we can't, despite our attempts, we can't actually keep the journey of life from transforming us. It gets in in some way or another. So that's kind of a beautiful thing, too, to realize that no matter how much I fight and push and struggle and try to keep myself safe and keep everything the same, like awakening, essentially, will work its way in and start to soften things up around us. And if you're like me, then it's just like, defend the castle walls. Oh, they got in. Defend the castle wall. Oh, it's like this back and forth sort of coagulating and dissolving, coagulating and dissolving, and coagulating and dissolving. No, I think that makes us flexible. It makes us responsive to life to go through those phases over and over and over again. And the more I do it, I just go, I don't know. I just, so like looking around this tiny room I'm in is like piled high with, we still have somehow 10 times as many belongings as we're going to be able to take on the airplane. <laughs> And um, I don't know. What's there to say about that? It seems like everything's going wrong with this move so far. And, um, and the more things that go wrong, it seems like somehow I get more and more free. It just goes, shit, I can't. What am I going to do about it? You know? And um, it seems much more interesting to be concerned about what am I going to have for lunch today? Or you know, what are we going to talk about this morning? So, that might be it for now. Let's sit some more. All right. Always a crowd pleaser. Although, I don't know, I can remember lots of retreats sitting there and going, good God, are we going to sit again? <laughs> Not always a crowd pleaser, but you know, it's like, take your vitamins, they're good for you. The bell, a gift from the vast ocean. Gift from the far ocean. Due to unfortunate circumstances beyond our control, we find ourselves here. Fortunate, unfortunate, fortunate, unfortunate. And you can feel it as we're sitting here, it's like peach blossoms. Gifts from the far ocean. Gifts from the far ocean. The sound of the washing machine. The ache in my left ankle. Gifts from the far ocean. <laughs> Thank you.
Gifts from the Far Ocean. On Captain James Cook's uh, explorations, he had a Tahitian navigator named Tupaya. who's a high priest and a navigator. And no matter where in the world they were, the crew could ask Tupaya, where is home? And he would point. 
And he was always right. Where is Tahiti? It's what our practice does. We can ask it at any moment. Where is home? It'll point right to it. You notice at some point we stop being concerned with whether things are falling away or falling apart or breaking or because there's just this. It's hard to say whether circumstances are fortunate or unfortunate. Just rakshasas. Or clear skies. funny I like doing reading about Polynesian navigation stuff it's hard to I want to tell you all the stories in a, in meditation I was sitting kind of telling the stories to myself and really wanted to tell you all about it and then trying to figure out whether they're relevant at all to anything or whether I just love the stories I want to tell you so I feel like well I don't know if I love it that's probably a good indication and um, so Tupaya that this guy, this Tahitian high priest, he's actually the a high priest of a Tahitian god of war, and, uh, and also a, a master navigator, um, and uh, just remarkable the way the Polynesians were able to navigate the open ocean. They could read the world like a map. They'd use the sun, the moon, and the sun, the stars, the wave and swell patterns, the movement of the um, of the ocean creatures, the flight paths of the birds. Um, they could even use, you know, the wind patterns, the clouds, the shapes and the movements of the clouds. Like they just knew how to just imagine the kind of practice it took of, the, of just observing, just observing, just observing. And uh, one of their big things was to be able to find land on the open ocean because it Polynesia is made up of this series of hundreds of like very small islands. <laughs> you can only have a society be so big before it outgrows the island and you need to branch out. So they became experts at finding land. And um, one of the things that I love is one little detail about, you know, some islands will rise up out of the water and some will be very low or maybe a coral atoll or something that it's hard to see from very far out so they could look at the clouds and you, they could they could see a low-lying island as it was reflected in the bottom of the cloud so you can tell like wow and, uh, they had you know star charts to um with houses with homes for every star where the star would come from at night and where it would go home to when the dawn came so just beautiful connection, a sense of connection to the world. And um, Tupai, although he was from Tahiti, um, when they sailed to New Zealand, he was surprised to find out that he could communicate with the Maori people quite easily. It's like a group of society of people he'd never met, but because of the common base of language, and he could actually communicate quite well about complex matters. So there's that interesting thing, too, about, I don't know, there's a fundamental language fundamental connection between whoever you might discover on your journey you know if you don't think if you don't think these people are different from me i can't connect with them you might be surprised by what you can connect with and not just the people but the birds and the grasses and the volcanoes and all that stuff too some kind of an amazing guy just that thing about tupaya where is home He'd think for a moment and then he'd point. In the beginning, they'd check it out with their instruments and they go, by God, he's right. He does know where Tahiti is. You know? But then they just started to rely on it. Like He's as reliable as any instrument, maybe more. 
So there's that too, and that brings we just had a bit with that con yesterday. The here is the stone drenched with rain, pointing the way. It's just great, you know. Here is the stone drenched with rain, pointing the way. Here is the stone drenched with rain, pointing the way. You've always got, you've always got whatever navigation equipment you need on board already, and um, if you don't know where you're going. It might be because where you're going has not appeared in the world yet. <laughs> so it's that too. You don't know the answer to your question. It's because it might not exist. And even if it does exist, it's just like it takes four to six weeks for delivery. So patience is, I think patience is a good thing on the journey. And then, uh, and patience is not just like being calm, but being a certain fortitude, I think, to to um, not fall off our horse every time we see a mouse kind of thing. We don't know. We just We don't know if circumstances are favorable or unfavorable. I don't know, when, when do you get to make the conclusion about that? Um, sometimes I think, well, when I'm lying on my deathbed, then I can look back at my life and I can decide what was fortunate and unfortunate. But then even, I don't know, it's hard to say. So the one other story I want to tell you um, that I'm not entirely sure is for good reason is, um, is a, uh, it's a myth about the birth of navigation in Polynesia. It's the story of the Kuling which was on, the, was on the registration page for today. So the Kuling came from the far ocean, wherever that is. You know, you know where the far ocean is. It came from there and it was a, a bird, but it was not a bird, it was a ghost, but it took the form of a sandpiper. And one day it landed on the beach of a tiny island called Pulap. And you can look it up very small island, landed on the beach. And uh, in the morning, the daughter of the chief of Pulap came down to the beach to gather water and she saw this sandpiper and she thought, whatever, she went about um, collecting water, but then it started to speak to her. Young woman, young woman, <laughs> she looked around, there's nobody there. She's looking at just this bird there. She thought, uh, you know, you shouldn't have drank so much kava last night. So she goes about and she, young woman, young woman. She looks over and indeed it is the bird speaking to her. It says, I am the Kuling. I've just come from the Marshall Islands and I ate everyone who lived there. And now I'm going to eat everyone on your island unless you feed me until I'm full. Look kind of great, right? Creature comes out of the spirit realm and tells you, I'm going to eat everyone you know unless you feed me until I'm full. <laughs> and uh, this young woman, the, the chief daughter, was this remarkable woman, just because she's a little startled by the, being talked to by a bird, but kind of kept her cool and went up the hill to her father and said, uh, You know, I just saw this bird on the beach and was telling me, ate everyone in the Marshall Islands and and it's going to eat all of us unless we feed it until it's full. And the chief just kind of nodded and said, here, take this coconut shell with cooked taro in it, just a little bit. Taro is like this kind of purplish root. That's a you know, basis for a lot of the foods in, uh, in Polynesia and Hawaii. Uh, it's a staple, starchy thing. So take this little piece of pounded cooked taro. And here, take this little stunted coconut, just this little one. And so she took them, went down to the cooling and, and um, offered it the taro and it nodded and she pulled it out. It's just a tiny, teeny, tiny. I mean, this is like a little, little bird, a little teeny, tiny piece of taro. And fed it to the cooling and it said, chewed it up and said, more. <laughs> she was kind of worried because she only brought that much. So she looked into her coconut shell and there was more taro. Okay, when she fed that to the bird, the bird said, more. She looked in, every time she looked in the coconut shell, there was more taro. So she just fed it and fed it and fed it and fed it. And she was amazed how much this tiny bird could eat, but she just kept feeding it. And even when the cooling said, thank you, I'm full, there was still taro left in the coconut bowl. You get this beautiful 
thing about the inexhaustible quality of nourishment in that moment, right? Nourishing the spirit realm in that way. And then the Kuling said, well, now I'm thirsty. Go, oh, that's right. This, I brought this coconut. Brings out this little tiny coconut. So he cracks a hole in it with a rock and holds it up to the Kuling's mouth and starts, the Kuling starts to drink and it drinks and it drinks and it drinks and it drinks and it drinks. And she's afraid that at any moment the coconut juice might run out, but it Kuling ah, thank you, I'm no longer thirsty. And she looks inside and there's still juice in the coconut. She's kind of amazed. So she sets that down. She looks at the cooling like, <laughs> okay, what next? As her eyes, are, she's really like, world's been turned upside down in a matter of an hour. And uh, the cooling says, thank you very much. I'm now full. Now you must go to your father, have him build me a hut on the beach. And come to me every night, and I will teach you the sacred art of navigation. And so she does. She goes back to the beach every night, and she studies with the Kuling, who teaches her the, how to read the stars, the dance of the stars and the moon and the sun as they fly across the sky, and how the waves move out and around the islands, and how the sea creatures move, and even how to, how to taste um where she is that the salinity of the water would be different in different places um so you can taste what it means to be close to home or far away or close to another island and uh, so she becomes the first great open ocean navigator of polynesia and passes on the teachings to further generations so kind of an amazing thing, and it's not so different from our own lives, right? Some strange creature comes from the far ocean and um, sometimes bringing something that seems like a threat or at least a disruption or something that's just outside, like that moment when something comes into your life and you go, what? I don't know what to do with that. Um, and it, yet it also brings this tremendous gift. And um, when we interact with it, what I find is that we, somebody brought this up in the retreat yesterday, I really loved this, that inexhaustible quality about I can just give and give and give and it keeps replenishing itself. In a way, we never run out of whatever it is that we need for the path. You know, the energy that, the energy for the journey. And um, if we can meet that inconceivable thing, and meet that creature from the spirit realm, meet the rakshasas even. If we can just sail to the land of the rakshasas and find a place among them, then the whole universe is open to us. The whole universe is unavailable. There's not anywhere that we cannot go and not be free. Kind of, a, kind of an amazing promise. Right? Um, but it does seem important that the chief's daughter doesn't run away. <laughs> she just goes, she just takes on the task. Oh, you want me to feed you? Well, okay, let me go talk to my dad. Maybe he's got some idea. And, and um, so it's like that. Gifts from the far ocean. It's like that thing. I don't know, who's it? Zhao Zhou. I don't know who it was. Teacher, when times of great difficulty visit us, how should we meet them? The teacher just says, welcome. Because we don't know. I don't know. When, when, is, when is it time to make a determination about whether something is fortunate or not? Or whether something is broken or just falling away? Whether something is going terribly wrong or your life is just transforming? Or something new is emerging? So, that's probably enough for me, um, but I'd love to hear from some other people, including dun, 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 dun. Serena Dean. It's so nice to see you. Do you have anything you want to say? Yes, I do. Um, I was thinking about, I was on retreat a couple years ago and it was lunchtime and I um, picked up my plate and I dropped it accidentally and it shattered on the floor. And there was this moment of like 
me feeling like, oh God, like I've just shattered literally the silence and all of that. And then Michael Wilding said, that was fantastic. <laughs> um, and it just kind of opened up everything. And I was thinking of that with the lamp and I am coming up on eight months pregnant. And I was thinking about what you were saying about you should be excited. I mean, I like, there's just, I feel like I've been blown to the land of the Rakshasas a lot of the time, you know, it's, uh, didn't expect to, you know, want to have a baby. And, um, now we're thinking that maybe Portland is not the right place for us given, and we want to move back to the Bay. And so my identity is just kind of shattering. Um, and I don't know, there was something about today of like, isn't that fantastic, right? Like, I can't see it. Like I'm there. I'm just like, oh my God. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of Michael's music and your talk. And it's just like, yeah, um, isn't that fantastic? Nice. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That's the whole thing right there. Gina, do you want to say anything? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> perfect timing. Oh, you're blowing your nose? Do you want to say something? <laughs> well, would you like to hear me blowing my nose? Um, it, yeah. Um, thank you, Jesse. I, I've been thinking a lot about effortless action. I, I had listened to some talks from Joan Sutherland. Um, and in my life right now, I'm I am that person who is is always managing and and when you were describing that, I actually am invigorated by the problem solving and the and the if there's something really stimulating about that and finding that or being able to recognize when it slips from that into what you were describing, because it does. And so that's been a practice for me of like how to feel energized and able to participate in what's happening and when to have the patience and let the matter rest. And it's been a really tremendous uh, thing for me to work with, with each of my journeys. And um, it's just a helpful thing for me to kind of feel into the environment and how can my participation affect, help, hurt, you know, what, how am I going to influence the whole environment instead of just the parts that I want? And that helps to drop that away, which is, is great for me. Thanks. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Oh, nice. I, keep <laughs> I want to respond. I'm like, I don't know what people are saying is so great. I <laughs> just keep my mouth shut. Laura Ferguson, do you want to say anything? Sure. I was um, actually thinking about something that came up in the um, yesterday during the retreat um, when somebody mentioned, I think it was um, from Joan Sutherland about, can you trust your life? Um, and, and part of what I was getting from the retreat yesterday and today as well is the um, reading what's here, um, trusting what's here, um, and learning to read the clouds and to read the ocean and to read the swells and to, to trust the reflections and yeah, I, um, there's something about like that you brought up that it's not a metaphor. This is your life. Um, and, and this is, is how I'm guided, you know, this, and, and I, I won't know if it's uh, a good thing or a bad thing, even in the end. Um, but do I trust my life? Yeah. So that's what's going through my mind. Yeah, that's Thanks. beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> that is it's the it's not a metaphor thing makes me think of um, David Weinstein do, doing his koan practice, 
years and years and years ago and going through the miscellaneous koans with John Tarrant and he, um, oh, what is it? Again, oh, with the, the it's a koan about, um, probably somebody else knows it. Dan Kaplan probably knows that he's like a repository for koans. What's the one about, um, why can't the person who can count all all the grains of sand on the beach can't stand on the head of a pin or something? Do you know that one? I do not. Oh, okay. Maybe we'll... Well, anyway, it's a koan with like the image of a needle in it. And David Weinstein was like walking around Oakland and just feeling everything, like poking him like a needle. He went, oh, <laughs> like this is... It's not a metaphor. It's actually my life. There are actually flesh-eating demons. I might be one of them. There are actually, you know, spirit birds coming and threatening my existence and things like that. So, yeah. And in a way, you can you can trust those images um, and, and go with it. I think that's part of the magic of the koan practice is you actually, like, you end up in this, like, bizarre realm um that's actually turns out to be your life <laughs> we're not putting all the sort we're not imposing all the logic on it. it's kind of magical mystical um cory hitchcock is I, I love that how much you say that this is a mystery school so it reminded me it is a mystery school you know it's just like life is strange it just gets stranger and stranger so speaking of cory hitchcock do you want to say anything Oh, sure. Thank you, Jesse. I, uh, I found myself just laughing out loud uh, a lot of times <laughs> today. And uh, I guess um, the, the part of the journey lately is one of the things about what we're in seems to be the extremes of climate change are bringing confinement. And so I'm often feeling like confined, like I could go outside because it's too hot or it's too cold or it's raining or it's a bomb cycloning. And, um, and what I felt today as a gift of the far ocean was laughter, that that comes so unexpectedly and is often the harbinger of change for me. And um, the image that came was being in a kind of peak experience of being in the ocean. And um, when the swells got kind of too big, mm -hmm. but they weren't breaking. And I, I know how to body surf and I love that, but for whatever reason, I went feet first over a bunch of waves and you would go way up and then you would go way down. It was just exhilarating. So anyway, thank you. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Yeah, it is. I love that you bring up like climate change, which is just this massive beyond us. You know, we've got projections about what might happen, but it's just like to really, I don't know, you know, scientists have been talking about it for a while now, but it's, it's becoming abundantly clear if you're a believer in climate change anyway. Like, wow, shit's really changing. You've got atmospheric rivers in California. You've got massive amounts of snow where I'm living in Washington, where there aren't usually. And you've got deep freezes in South Texas and like there's huge forces at play, um, just remarkable and kind of terrifying, you know, it definitely, it throws us out of the, the frame of what we're expected, uh, of what we expect. And so that's a journey thing too. And, and, and easy to go, oh, climate change, it's so terrible and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I'm not a fan of it, but I don't know. It's part of our transformation process, part of the earth's transformation process. It's, it seems to be the way things are going. So, and, um, you know, not to say you shouldn't try to change it, because if that's what's in your heart, then that's what's in your heart. Um, I try to recycle, but um, you know, there's this other kind of point of view available about, like you said, Court, like, well, I'm just feet first, riding the swells up and down, riding the, the immensity of the journey that we're all on together. Um, Sarah Bender, do you want to say anything? I, th this morning feels like a gift from the far ocean. <laughs> it's really, really um, lovely. And, um, and I guess I, I, aging is coming up. And the, the, that question about falling away versus falling apart um, is really lovely. And one of, the, one of the recent things that came up was getting ready for a, a flight. And um, 
I used to be just last minute, everything would happen last minute. I can't do that anymore because it doesn't hold up when you get old. And so I was, I thought I had everything pretty well prepared. And it was kind of late at night, you know, 1130 midnight. And I needed to get up at three because, you know, to take the early flights from Denver. It's like that. So I was all set. And I woke up at four and it turned out I had set my alarm for four. Really? <laughs> I'm like, whoo, okay then. I have to be out of the house by 4.30. And, um, and I was out of the house by 4.30. And there wasn't a backup of lines and lines of cars going into the airport. And there was a space in the parking lot, you know, like that. And, um, and there are a lot of things like that happening. And I just realized that they're showing up in my dreams as well. Dreams where I don't have the right suitcase or I don't have the plane ticket, all of those. And it's always okay. And there's, in a, in a way, it's like those dreams are also a gift from the far ocean. You know, the ocean of this is so much bigger than you. And, you know, most of the time, it's okay, even when it's not. Um, and and the, the other, really quickly, an image that comes up is when I'm in Nova Scotia on the water. Um, I mean, sleeping right over three feet over the water. And the way my body starts to feel the rhythms. And, and so I'm feeling the rhythms of moon, the rhythms of sun, the rhythms of tide, and and watching in my little kayak how incredibly complex the ripples are. Um, and, and that one of the, Joan said once that one of the translations of Dharma really, or one of the characters for Dharma is ripples on the water. So yeah, lots of gifts <laughs> of Jesse Carden as well. <laughs> Thank you for your gift of Sarah Bender. That's beautiful. I love that. I didn't know the thing about the characters for Dharma. That's beautiful. Yeah, what a beautiful image of lying on the water and feeling the feeling the ripples. Yeah. Try let's try that together. Just stop for a moment, close your eyes, and see if you can feel the ripples of the Dharma. It was kind of exhilarating. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, hey, Mark. Mark Gabriel, do you want to say anything? Um, sure. I've, I've been laughing a lot, too. Uh, love the plate-shattering, fantastic... And uh, one of the thing about um, the journey and the, uh, sh the people who said, where's home? And that question, like, that qu question just, like, brought me right home. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's great. But I also think about, I've been thinking about the journey when I'm not feeling quite home and uh, trying to welcome that, that part. Um, I used to work with disabled people and I had a, one of the guys had had a stroke, um, and he had aphasia, so he couldn't talk, uh, no, the only phrase he retained and he said it all the time was almost home, which was incredible. <laughs> so you meet him and he'd say almost home. And so I was holding that too. <laughs> Thank you. That's really touching. That's really touching. Mm -hmm. Almost home. Almost home. Almost home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe one. Of, this is so great. I love hearing from other people. Like I, I could have been doing less talking this whole time and just ask other people to talk. It's way more interesting. Um, Christy, do you want to say anything? Hi. Oh, thank you. Yeah, like Sarah saying, this whole 
this whole time is such a big gift. And I feel like I'm still unwrapping the sparkly paper. Uh, I, I loved how you introduced or how you decided to tell those stories by saying, oh, if I, if I love it, then that's a good indication, like thinking about that as a way of orienting and how your friends did that too by after cancer treatment and everything stripped away, then maybe it's clear like, oh, the place I love, that's, that's how I'm gonna orient myself. Mm. So I'm thinking about that. And, um, and I've, I've been long fascinated by the Polynesian navigation training intense training, like becoming an instrument of perceiving one's place in the world and one's not just a relationship, but identity with the world. Um, and like Sarah was saying about feeling the ripples in your actual body, like how they, that was part of their training, aside from memorizing all the signs, that part of the training was lying in the boat and being able to distinguish the surface currents from the deep swells, from the myriad other movements in your body and how that's somehow related to what you're saying about, oh, if I love it, then that's an indication, like how I feel it. Yeah. And then I'm excited for your move for you. And I'm excited for your baby for you, Serena. <laughs> so I feel like, oh, well, maybe that's part of it too. It's like, your um, emotions can just be in the ocean around you, and that's part of it too. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thanks. Oh, that's beautiful. And th yeah, thanks. That, isn't that great? If I'm not having my my excitement, somebody else might be holding it for me. <laughs> so thank you for holding that for me. I'm not sure I had room for for excitement over the last few weeks. So beautiful. Yeah, I love that what you said about distinguishing the surface currents from the deep currents and and becoming yourself becoming an instrument of navigation or to, to be able to locate yourself in the yeah that's a beautiful thing that's like that's one of the things about um to ask i ask myself this question quite a bit particularly if i'm if i'm feeling disturbed or something i i just ask the question where am i right now like what's an image for where i am right now in my life and um and it could be a visual, and sometimes I'll get a visual image. It could be whatever, you know, I'm thrashing around in the tar pit, or I'm skiing down a slope of pure white powder, or facing a sheer cliff, or whatever it is. Um, and it also it can also appear in my body. I might not have an image, but I'll have a feeling for like, what is it? And I'll notice, oh, my shoulders are hunched over as though I'm I'm bearing something, or um, or maybe I feel incredibly tall and and uh, lengthy um, and light. And so it's just interesting to have a, it's a way of locating where am I in my life right now. And, and um, I don't know, I tend to trust those images and carry them with me. And, and at the very least, it's like having a, it's like having a, a song to hum when you walk through the forest at night, something to keep you company, you know, a way of listening to the world and listening to the deep psyche. So thank you everyone who spoke and thank you everyone who didn't speak and thanks for being here with me. There's no, not many ways I'd rather spend my Sunday. So wonderful to be here with you all on the journey. And I think Amaryllis and Todd are going to get us out of here.
beings of the world. I vow to set endless heartache to rest. I vow to walk through every wisdom gate. I vow to live the great Buddha way. I vow to wake all the beings of the world. I vow to set endless heartache to rest. I vow to walk through every wisdom gate. I vow to live the great Buddha way. I vow to wake all the beings of the world. I vow to set endless heartache to rest. I vow to walk through every wisdom gate. I vow to live the great Buddha way. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Amaryllis. Thank you, Michael, for playing. Thanks to everyone who spoke and didn't speak and brought gifts from the far ocean. And next week, John Tarrant will be back. And hopefully, so will all of you.